Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Uh, we are. Is this Thursday morning? You just you uh, just woke up from. A long I just woke up. I've uh, I, uh, I I I I don't know how much I should reveal about what I do in my in my in, my, in the dark hours. Uh, I, I I had a couple of late night uh, late late night uh, articles to do. I my recently political we can talk about. I actually did a thing for a German newspaper this week. Um, there's a, I can't pronounce the actual name of it, but it's known as Taz. Um, but it's one of, it, it's not like the new German newspaper, but it's one of the, one, one of one of the notable ones there. And every so often I've written a, a piece of like, what the hell's going on, what the hell's going on over there kind of pieces. And they wanted one for, you know, sort of a year in Trump, like what's, what it's America thinking about Trump. So I uh, did that and, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, um, trying to do a book, I'm trying to do a book. And uh, I need to write a sample chapter to see if I can get a book deal. So I've been, I've been slaving away on that. And you're also a uh, father of the year, husband of the year. Well, not, no, now I'm not husband of the year because I'm, I'm doing <laughs> this while my wife's with our sick kids. So, But you've got other – you've got stuff. You've got other response. You're not just a writer. But, you're yes, that, that is true. But I, I, father. I do all this work late at night because I can't do it all during the day. And I think I, I had one one all night or too many, and so and, yeah. and the, the I don't kid, like to the, toss I don't like to toss the word hero around, you know, <laughs> cavalierly. <laughs> but the, the kids are home sick, and my wife's with the kids, and she's she she's a city councilor. She's at a city council meeting tonight. She needs some time, so uh, I I can't go on too long. I, I love talking to you. Believe me, I'd rather be talking to you. Believe me. But, uh, <laughs> so we're squeezing this in. Uh, it's ten. 36 you just woke up uh if that puts this in perspective so uh i don't know what they're gonna they, they used to call these things like the uh the, the hangover edition of or you know, they, remember they used to name them things like that I, I don't know if they do that anymore but the suits at blogging heads yes um so forgive me if, I, if i'm not up to speed on what's happened this morning but i do know i do know that uh if Congress doesn't pass some kind of bill to keep the government open by midnight Friday, about 38 hours from now, uh, as we are taping, that the government will shut down. Uh, and I wrote a piece for Politico, which was titled Shutdowns Are for Losers. Uh, my my working title, which was not chosen, was which, Why Democrats Will Own the Shutdown. Uh, and... And assuming that it's because of the Democratic demand to have a fix for the Dreamers that it shuts down. I mean, there is a chance that uh, ordinary Republicans will shut it down over uh, spending issues, wanting to cut spending more. But I don't think that's going to be the case. I think the Freedom Caucus guys are going to come around. Um, and it is true, I did see yesterday that you know Lindsey Graham on the Senate side yeah. might join Democrats in refusing to vote for the bill if they don't do a DACA fix. So if he's in there, then it's sort of anomaly by bars and shut down. But, and there's uh, also, he would also be concerned about defense spending as well. Yes. He has said that, but it, I got the impression that is, um, he, he was jumping in with the Democrats on the DACA demand. He feels that he was jerked around by Trump, uh, that they have a, they have a, a perfectly good bipartisan deal on the table. It's been long enough and they should do this. Uh, and look, uh, DACA, fixing DACA is important. Uh, the, it involves real humans uh, who should not be pawns in a political game. I mean, I, the, but what people are missing in this is there's a there's a hard deadline Friday to get the government open. There is not a hard deadline Friday to keep DACA open. DACA right. is open. <clears throat> DACA is in effect as of today. There is a judicial preliminary injunction. The Department of Homeland Security is currently taking work permit renewal applications. And if so, once they process your application, it's good for two years. Um, so there, there was an issue when, when Trump made his order in September uh immigration advocates were saying this hard deadline is not really a march it's a rolling deadline if people's uh permits expire uh after this past september 
they're out of luck. Um, and nothing's and they and they can't apply for a renewal. Uh, so you already had roughly fifteen thousand people uh, who were lacking a permit, lacking an ability to work uh, between September and January. Now, as far as we know, they were not deported, but their lives weren't in a good place because they were really they were kind of stuck in this limbo. Uh, so they were saying, look, this, so the immigration advocates were saying back in late November, this is of absolute urgency. You have to <clears throat> make this part of these spending agreements because the government opened or, or else you are not doing your due diligence to help the dreamers. Uh, and putting that argument aside, that's just not the case right now. <laughs> um, so why, why is that not the case right now? Because a judge last week issued a ruling saying uh, Trump's uh, uh, reasoning for uh, killing DACA was on dubious legal ground. Uh, it is likely that the petitioners will win their case. They are uh, they are suffering irreparable damage in the interim. And so until the legal arguments are fully uh, ex exhausted, we are going, uh, I, I am decreeing you have to keep DACA in place. Um, so it's, there's good, there's still much legal wrangling to, uh, to go through. It's sort of like the, the travel ban issue. Uh, it's possible an appellate court or the Supreme court is going to overturn this injunction, uh, let alone agree with Trump on the broader question of whether he has the power to kill DACA the way that he did. Um, but as of today, that's not the case. Um, so uh, there's not a, an imminent urgency to link DACA with the spending bill. So now, I'm sorry to interrupt, Bill, but sure. Trump, when Trump initially announced, you know, the end of DACA, or he set a deadline of March right. for Congress to address it. Is that a hard deadline? Well, so on one sense. It's uh, it's too generous to say. So let's take the judges thing out of it. You know, so before that judges thing, the immigration advocate argument argument was that deadline is not in the distance. It's a rolling deadline because if your work permit expires before March, Homeland Security was not letting you renew, and you're oh, already see. screwed. Um, on the other side, several Republicans have said, eh, you know, if we don't have a deal by March, you know, Trump can push that back." It's not a fixed deadline. It's totally arbitrary. So you know, we're going to get a, a deal done and just give us the time to do it. Uh, and so that to me, that's a more complicated question because yeah. dreamers weren't being deported, but they were, but some, a smaller portion of them were being vulnerable to deportation. And after March, it was March 8th, then they all would be vulnerable to deportation, and that's coming up to seven hundred thousand. So it, so um, it sounds it sounds like what you're saying is that this judge last week, the judge who who issued this injunction, that actually undermines the Democrats' argument that it is imperative that a DACA fix be included in any budget, you know, short term deal to keep the government open. So that yeah. that in a sense, it takes away. The argument it takes, it takes with the urgency. I mean, it's not not it, it, it shouldn't make you relaxed. You should still work on the issue. I mean, the, uh, this injunction could get tossed out any day, uh, but it's just not today. Uh, so you go back to past shutdown. So there, there's there's two things I'm seeing in the conversation and not just from Democrats, mind you, uh, that say one. Uh, Republicans control Washington, so the government shuts down. It's their fault. And two, Republicans always get blamed for shutdowns. So they, they, the Republicans are always gleeful when the government shuts down. Trump said last May he wanted to shut down. No one's going to buy. Democrats want to shut down. Uh, and to me, this is just a total wrong lesson from the last two shutdowns. The person, the, the party that provokes the shutdown 
it gets blamed for the shutdown. It's not because Republicans are magnets for blame. It's that they provoked la the last shutdowns. They thought well, the time. No, but let me let me let me explain though that there there is. You may be right, but there is a rationale as to why Republicans always get blamed, and it's because there's the assumption that Republicans. Well, there's always been the assumption that Republicans are the anti-government party and the assumption that Democrats are pro-government. So that's baked into the cake and that skews how the perception of this. And then I think more recently there's a perception that Republicans are, are sort of playing Russian roulette and uh, are, are chaotic and that Democrats are more. I mean, this is maybe not right, but this is the perception that Democrats are, are more prudent. So in other words, there is an argument that even if Democrats deserve blame, the public will punish Republicans more because of the perceptions. But because of all those factors you mentioned, those are the factors that led Republicans to push for shutdown in 95 and 2013. So in 1995, it was a uh, Gingrich uh, had just <clears throat> become Speaker of the House. Bill Clinton had been kind of weakened after losing Congress. Uh, Gingrich wanted to turn the screws and, and force G Clinton to accept a very austere seven-year balanced budget timeline. After the first shutdown, which was kind of short, Clinton said, okay, I'll do a seven-year balanced budget. Uh, and then Gingrich got greedy and said, okay, now your seven-year balanced budget has to you know, totally gut Medicare and Medicaid. And Clinton finally said, no, you're, you're asking too much here. Uh, and then the longer shutdown that started around December, late December of twenty uh, of, of 1995 went very badly for, for Republicans. Uh, but it was clear. So the Gingrich thought, one, no one's going to care the government shut down. The, the people are going to learn that the government doesn't do anything. Two, Clinton's vetoing our budget. He's the one at fault. Right. Uh, but that's not how everyone knew it. Gingrich was making an incredibly unreasonable demand and was itching for the shutdown. He had said things on record saying that a shutdown okay. would be just fine. You, uh, I would say, though, you may be right, but you are operating under the assumption that the public is very well informed and made an informed decision based on a, a nuanced interpretation. Whereas the other argument would be, no, the public isn't that well informed. It's based on what they hear. Number one, how the media portrays it and the media is likely to go against Republicans if I would say as a rule the media tends to be liberally biased and the other part of the equation is uh, rather than um, have this nuanced interpretation the public just reflexively says oh Republicans are against government of course they shut down government if the shutdown is solely because there's not a DACA deal in place and it happens because Senate Democrats filibuster the bill. It's going to be reported. I mean, this is the thing that people. Are, I mean, I grant you, there's 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 media bias and perception. Some people are going to knee jerk blame Republicans just because they're Democrats and they hate Trump. You know, that it's not going to be a hundred percent blaming, but there's going to be written in every story just the plain fact that Democrats filibustered this bill. <laughs> because of something that Democrats want to achieve. It's just the basic stuff. Well, I know, uh, but you said something, you introduced some new information that I think is really important here, which is that there would be um, a, uh, a filibuster, that there would be, so that, that's something that is a visual, you know, there's, a, there's, um, there's a picture of, of maybe somebody gets up and gives this, you know, keeps talking or whatever. Right. Um, so that's introducing, I think, a, a, a new angle. And, and maybe that was always implicit in your argument. But why well, don't you I, talk I, a little I, bit I, about I, that? I didn't get into the filibuster aspect of it in the piece because I, th I just thought it was so dead obvious. <laughs> um, but all, all, and all this pushback was, you know, how can you blame Democrats or Republicans control Washington? But they, I mean, yes, they control Washington in that they are the majority of Congress and they have the presidency, but the Senate operates under supermajority rules. I mean, the, the tax bill wasn't because that was reconciliation, but that's a once a year deal. That We're not in that anymore. Any that passed the Senate needs 60 votes. Democrat votes are needed. If Democrats withhold those votes, 
to uh, try to extract a concession from Republicans. They are the ones provoking the conflict. So all the media coverage, I mean, we've been through this. The media coverage shifts once there's an actual shutdown. So people are saying, we need to keep the focus on the fact that Trump is rejecting this bipartisan deal. Well, after a shutdown, the focus is on a shutdown. It's on what's shuttered, who's inconvenienced, who's not getting a paycheck, whose benefits aren't being processed in a timely way. Uh, it, it doesn't go By the way, I, well. I saw in the, in the Washington Post today that uh, Zinke is, uh, there's a plan to keep parks open. Republicans want to keep national parks open, even if there's a shutdown. Well, I mean, that's the kind of thing where, you know, you can look at that two ways. One, Republicans are scared they will get blamed, and so they want to inconvenience people as little as possible. Uh, the other side is Republicans want to show they really don't want a shutdown. They are trying very hard not to inconvenience people. Uh, and whoever is inconvenienced is going to say, these Republicans are the ones trying to screw us. It's those guys filibustering that are. Uh, but I'm going to go back. I, I think the process does matter. I mean, so if the ha if it happens in the House, though, there isn't a filibuster in the House. Right. So maybe it's harder to have that well, moment. Yeah, it, 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 Democrats can't block in the House by themselves. No, not by have, themselves. Republicans would have to help. Right. And your assumption is that the Freedom Caucus all... I, I don't know if I buy that assumption that the Freedom Caucus eventually, um, you know, comes comes together and votes... I mean, that, that, would, that would be a different story if there was a bipartisan shutdown right. because Democrats are mad about DACA and House Freedom Caucus is mad about levels of levels of spending or maybe right. they're mad about chip being in there. The Republicans are trying to put an extension of the children's health insurance program in, which Democrats want. Right, uh, which is the, the big Freedom breaking Caucus. news that you slept through this morning where Donald yeah. Trump <laughs> appears to have uh, weighed in on this. Um, Siding with the Freedom Caucus that Chip shouldn't be in there. Which is, it's I unclear. Mean, it's, he's, he's cryptic. Uh, there's different ways to interpret his tweet, as is always the case, as all, often the case, not always. Um, but that's the kind of thing that I think you know, I've seen some Democrats, you know, Democrat congressmen say, uh, you're being ridiculous, Republicans. You you could pass chip any day you wanted. And to try to throw this in our face now is wholly disingenuous. Right. It, is, then, it is wholly disingenuous, but the bare f if it is in the bill and it's on the floor, the f all the arguments that Democrats say, this is about real people. Right. These are real people's lives. This is a theme, well, this, though. Chips are this real is people's a theme. lives, too. There was a... There was a chance that Donald Trump, because he was elected in places like Ohio and Michigan um, and Wisconsin, there was there's always a chance because he, because of Democratic senators in North Dakota and West Virginia, yada, yada, yada. I mean, there was always a chance that Trump could squeeze Democrats. Right. And put them for once on the defensive. And it never happens. Trump never does it. They Claire McCaskill, Heidi Heidkamp. Joe Manchin have never been pressured. <laughs> Part of it's his approval rating, but they've never done. Trump has never allowed them to put the squeeze on them. And this is part of that. Right. So Republicans finally like, aha, we are going to put stuff in the CR. We're going to keep the government open because we don't want to get blamed for it. But we're going to put things in there. Everything but DACA. So we're going to dare Democrats to to not support that. And by the way, it's not it, Trump. It, it's confusing because it's unclear whether or not Trump realizes that this is like a six year reauthorization of chip. Right. He, right. It, he may think that it's a short term thing. But anyway, Republicans were trying to basically set this trap for Democrats or have this leverage. And Trump like comes in and totally in the 11th hour completely undermines that effort. You know, tr Trump is so deranged and so inherently mistrustworthy that it can be a little hard to get him out exactly how things are going to go and how much is he going to step into something that, you know, uh, you cause a problem where he doesn't have to cause a problem. Uh, but, but take, I, I would take that logic a little farther. Okay. What is the argument for using the shutdown tactic to win the DACA battle? Let, Cause we need to put pressure on Trump to, to do this deal. He is, he's racist. He walked away from a perfectly good deal for no logical reason except his racism. He needs to be pressured to the utmost and this gives us leverage. 
Well, how exactly does this give you leverage over Trump? What makes you think Trump's going to say, oh, woe is me. Oh, I'm so sad that the government is shut down. Oh, I guess I have no choice. This guy loves a fight. Right. This guy loves right. being in the... Th this, is, this is a battle royale. He's like, Screw you, Democrats. We're going to go play golf. Have a ball. Uh, yeah. And if this goes and, on and, for a month or two months and the public starts getting mad, maybe they're mad at both parties. Yeah. Who's going to blink first? Who's going to flinch? Democrats are going to flinch before Trump flinches. I think you have a good point here because... Um, it's sort of like, you know, I was just watching this documentary last night on Netflix about Stalin, uh, <laughs> which is helpful in this era. Um, and you know, Stalin never thought Hitler was going to invade Russia when he did, because uh, he was thinking like a rational person, you know. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Hitler was not thinking rationally. <laughs> so my point here, not to compare Trump to Stalin or Hitler. <laughs> But my point is, like, we are, you know, my assumption is Republicans will always get blamed for shutdowns because they always get blamed for shutdowns and yada, yada, yada. But the truth is that Trump really, the rules don't apply to him. And he very well may, be, it may be that a normal Republican, you know how, like, Mitt Romney sort of acted guilty because he was a rich guy, right? Like, he, he acted like it's a problem that I'm rich. And so if you act that way, then people, like, treat you that way. Whereas Trump's, like, flagrant, you know, about right. about being rich and conspicuous consumption. And nobody cares. Right. Because he just owns it. Like, this could be a case where a normal Republican would get killed for a government shutdown. But because Trump is so eccentric and iconoclastic and uh, whatever, um, unpredictable, you know, that that it doesn't stick to him the way it would someone else. So, I mean, I, I just want to be clear about myself because I feel like I'm getting a reputation for being just sort of like this, you know, pundit establishment hack and not 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 a left wing hack the way I used to be uh, considered by some. Uh, and. You know, my interest here is to solve the DACA problem. Uh, I don't think that this tactic is a good tactic to get what immigrant advocates and Democrats want. I don't. I don't. I, I feel it's an under. It's underpants gnome thinking that you do a shutdown and boom, you problem solves. It, it right. just doesn't wash with me based on history and based on the character you're dealing with. Would this you, is not a guy who is this is similar to, to what? Would you compare what Democrats are now thinking to what Ted Cruz was doing, like in 2013? It's very analogous. Uh, Ted Cruz thought, oh, Obamacare is unpopular. The polls for Obamacare are bad. Everyone's going to love the fact that I'm shutting down to defund it. DACA is very popular. Trump is not. If I shut down the government to help DACA, people will love me that I'm doing it. And no, neither side was thinking they might agree with you generally it doesn't mean they want to be personally inconvenienced over it or feel sympathy for those who are right. inconvenienced over it. shutting down the government feels like a petulant extreme unnecessary games playing tactic it does not come across like i'm trying to seriously solve a problem now i will uh, say the good the good news for democrats is republicans shut down the government in october of 2013 as i recall um, I believe the next month or a couple weeks later, Republicans lose the Virginia gubernatorial election. And uh, it's reasonable to suggest that that the shutdown cost them that election. So hey, however, the mix. however, a year later, Republicans do terrific in the midterm elections, right? But this is I I, I mean and so my Democrats... point is there's time if you're a Democrat even if they do make this mistake, which I think you're probably right about, or at least you have a point about. They've got so long between now and the midterms that this wouldn't be a catastrophic mistake. Oh, I, I wouldn't necessarily argue that what they do today is going to impact uh, a year from me. It could, but but you know, there, there's this facile argument I think that both the Cruz defenders on the right and. Jealous Democrats, I think they should play more hardball tactics on the left, say, well, 
obstruction didn't hurt Republicans. You know, Mitch McConnell didn't get hurt by obstructing. Ted Cruz didn't get hurt by obstructing. They still they still won midterms in 2010 and 2014. Yeah, but shutdown itself in that month of October drove Republican approval down to its lowest point in 25 years. They won in 2014 because they stopped doing stuff like that. And people forgot about it. It's not because they did it. They did not win the policy objective they tried to win. They did not fund Obama, defund right. Obamacare. They have a lot of other things. That you and I both, I think, agree on, which is to say, um, you can, you, you can either try to like um, replicate the bad deeds of your adversaries, or you can try to be the opposite. Like if if it's true that we elect people who are the opposite of the last guy, then do you want to try to ape Donald Trump and Republicans and imitate their, their worst features and tactics? Or do you want to try to brand yourself as the, we are the competent party, we are the serious party, um, we are the party the, that functions, you know, I mean, I, I think you can do both. I mean, Democrats, they've been totally correct in copying McConnell and withholding support for practically everything else. <laughs> they, they, they don't have to be handmaids of the Trump administration. Uh, they should make things very hard for Republicans to get things done. So whatever dysfunction occurs, it, it exposes Republican disunity and incompetence and, and bad intent. Um, but there are limits to that strategy. And there, when Republicans did not adhere to those limits, they got burned. No, I just so want to be clear, though, The Bill, worst parts of it. I want to be clear. Are you saying that Democrats should try to be obstructionist to stop things that they think are bad public policy? Or are you saying that Democrats should play politics and try to be obstructionist even on good things or neutral things uh, because the gridlock and the sense of, of impotence will reflect poorly on Republicans. I, I wrote a piece about this uh, a year ago. I, I think Democrats should give bare minimum cooperation for government to function. And keeping it open might be including in that category. It, it, it definitely includes that. <laughs> I, I said Democrats should not shut down the government. Democrats should not um, screw the debt limit. Um and if there's something on the table that's like that's unquestionably good, like if, if there was an infrastructure bill that Democrats actually like, maybe it's got certain parts that they don't like or it's attached to something that they don't like, but by and large, it's kind of what they want. That's just petty to say, well, uh, I don't want to give Trump a win. It's going to create a, a million jobs, but I don't want to give Trump a win. I think All that's right, a let, bad let me, let me play a complete hy hypothetical. Uh, it's not a complete hypothetical because I wrote a column about it recently at the Beast. But if if you and I could, you know, we're, we're kings of the world for the day, and we could just hash out a deal where you get a two thousand mile border fence, um, you you end chain migration for the Dreamers, um, and in exchange for that, I won't even get into e verify. In exchange for that, Democrats get DACA and some sort of a pathway to citizenship. So you've got a 2,000 mile wall in chain migration for the Dreamers in exchange for DACA um, and uh, a pathway, some sort of a pathway to citizenship. I don't think Democrats can do the wall. I, I would not do the wall. We've had this conversation. I, 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 I think I think the wall the wall is too much. I, I, I didn't I, say I, Democrats though. I said Bill Share. Even for Bill Share, the wall is too much. What's like? Who's afraid of Virginia? Wall? Like what's what's so bad? I think I think I think, I think, I think is, a continual a continuous wall on the border. I think I, I think I mean inefficient. If it was just inefficiency, I'd say sure, whatever. You know, go waste your money. It's like inefficient. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's gonna. I think it would poison relations with Mexico. I think it would have broader foreign policy complications. All right, but is that worth like number one appeasing a pretty good chunk of the American public who feels like this would make them happy, and B saving the dreamers and providing a pathway to citizenship? Like, wouldn't that be 
Is that a small price to pay? Like if Mexico's unhappy? Pfft. Uh, I, I, I think having your neighbor unhappy is a big, big problem. You you need relations with your neighbors. Um, All right. I'm just saying that the ends justify the means in this uh, case. I, I, we now have on record, you know, though Trump's denying it, we, we know in the White House that they know a 2,000-mile wall is ridiculous. By the way, I wanted to bring that up. I wanted to bring that up. So um, as we tape this on a Thursday, on uh, Wednesday evening, uh, John Kelly, the chief of staff appeared on a special report on Fox News with Brett Baer and said some things about Donald Trump evolving on the wall. Um, now, there are reports today, uh, the next day, that, that, that Trump is angry with Kelly. Um, however, Trump and, and, and Trump sent out, sent out a tweet clarifying. Trump says, I've never changed my position on the wall. I've never evolved. But then he goes on to evolve in that tweet <laughs> saying, of course, we're not going to have a 2,000 mile fence, you know, because I've always known, I've always said, it, I've always known that there are natural borders and barriers, you know, oceans and mountains that where it would be unnecessary and even imprudent. You know, I'm paraphrasing here. But my point is, did John Kelly go on Fox News in order to deliver a message to his boss and in effect achieve his goal of actually getting the president to evolve? on the wall. I just I mean, there is lots of evidence that Trump deep down has always known that the wall is, is bullshit. <laughs> um, he said a comment during the campaign in the New York Times that, you know, he, he knows that he, whenever he, his speech isn't going well, they throws out the wall and the crowd goes nuts. <laughs> uh, he was for, he, he, he said Mitt Romney lost the election because he didn't have a mob position in immigration. Uh, so there's this weird dichotomy where like Trump says abhorrently anti-immigrant racist things in private. So, you know, it's not right. it's, it's it's not all an act. <laughs> there's something deep seated there. But but this is actually I, I don't want to derail you because I want to come right back to this point. But there's a this is actually part and parcel of a larger problem, which is that Trump says contradictory things all the time. Right. And it's really hard. That's why Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, is saying we're not going to have an immigration bill until Trump clearly defines what he wants. Because we just saw today with the CR to keep the government open, Trump introduces these last minute changes having to do with the children's health insurance program. So it's really, I mean, in a way you're seeing it sort of as a feature, like Donald Trump changes, you know, but it really is also a problem that we oh, don't it, it's, really it's know huge, what he It's a huge problem, it's a huge problem. It. Uh, because he is fundamentally not a trustworthy person to do a deal with. Yes. So it's yes. hard. So so for the perspective, so let's let, we've talked a lot about you know scoring political points. So to put the political points question aside, what is the best way to get a deal done for dreamers who need a deal, whose lives will be ruined if there is no deal? Uh, the only way, so there's, well, there's, there's two paths. One is the judicial path, which is, and e even if Democrats can't win a, an ultimate favorable judicial ruling, if the wrangling goes on long enough and the injunction is in place long enough that Homeland Security is processing the permits, I mean, if they, you, you get a permit renewal today, it's good for two years. So if this is going on through you know November 2018, <laughs> There are people who have permits that are good through November 2020. Um, so there is a possibility there. This is, you know, there's a stopgap here that helps them on that alone. Now you can't In other words, on Donald that. Trump may not be president the next time Correct. your Correct. renewal comes up. Correct. Now, you can't, you can't put all your eggs in that basket. So you still need a legislative solution to be fully, um, uh, fully assured. That's going to require Trump's signature. No matter how fundamentally untrustworthy, no matter how racist he is, you need his signature, barring a two-thirds override in the Congress, which I don't think is really feasible. So you got to think about how do I how do I get the signature, the approval of a racist for a DACA deal? I don't see. Go back to my earlier point. I don't see how shutdown gets you there. He's going to revel in the shutdown. The temperature's got to go down. The temperature's got to cool. I mean, you need to get Trump in that place that he was in on Tuesday. He was like, hey, I'll do a deal. Give me the heat out of nowhere. <laughs> you know, uh, so you, so you got to get to that place. Uh, and I don't think shutdown right. gets you to that place. I mean, yeah. the, the, only the, point of leverage, the... the only point of leverage you have with him is, I mean, one, either there's no 
obvious leverage, and it just the temperatures are cool, and he, the 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 good Trump on his shoulder says sign sign the bill, uh, or there actually is that hard deadline coming up for DACA because of Trump's own deadline because the judicial ruling has been overturned, and Trump says. I can't have dreamers be deported on my watch. It looks terrible. These are sympathetic people. I'll look cruel and heartless. Even I, Donald Trump, can't suffer that. Those are the only two options. All right. But here's the problem, not to put too fine of a point on this, but here's the problem with with him not being a faithful negotiator. What if you and I, let's go back to our hypothetical deal, right? right? You say to me, as you often do, Maddie, sort of like... (laughs) Kind of the way that I call Robert De Niro Bobby, like in private. I'm talking to Bobby De Niro. Like, Maddie, Maddie, Maddie. I'd love to do this deal, M. Lou, but we they're gonna eat me alive if I cut this deal. You know that. You know how the left is. They're gonna they're gonna have me for breakfast if I cut this deal. So here's what we do. You and I both know we don't need a two thousand. You know, let's have a huge fence for a thousand miles in the area where there's the most foot traffic. You come out there, you put on your hard hat, you cut the ribbon, it's a great photo op. Then we're gonna have 500 miles of fencing. Eh, and we'll patrol that with unmanned vehicles, I, it's unclear. And then there's gonna be 500 miles. This, that, that we don't even need, you don't need it, nobody's there, it's fine. And this way I get to go tell my people, we, you know, we're not doing a wall across the whole border with, you know, and you get to go tell, you get your photo op. We can cut that deal, but what, but now, but think of it from your, your standpoint. You go back. Am, I, am, I, am I Trump now or am I Democrats? You're the Democrat. You're, you're okay. <laughs> um, someone's calling me. Uh, you go back and you tell your, your liberal friends, you know, in the, in the latte prius driving friends <laughs> i cut us a deal it's not perfect but we're going to get a pathway to citizenship we're going to save the dreamers and we're only you know we're going to do a wall but it's not going to be the whole wall i got them down to a thousand. I, I, don't, I i i cannot say to my democratic progressive immigrant allies i cannot use the word wall in my comments, I would need Structure. to be able to go to my people and say, security. "What I, we we we've made some concessions on border security, uh, but we did." And maybe we did. I agree. We're never going to call it a wall again. I'll never call it a wall again, right? I'm gonna. We're gonna call it a fence. We're gonna call it a, a a barrier. My point is, we go through all this haggling. You go back, and now you, you're hanging out there exposed, right? And if I double cross you, or if, let's say I'm Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell, the president tweets, failing Bill Cher from the failing Politico magazine. Thinks he's, you know, uh, we are going to build, the wall just got taller. You know? well, that's what I mean. That's why the, the trust the trust aspect is so yeah. is so fraught, because you just don't know how Trump is, how, how he's going to follow through with any kind of deal. But, uh, the, but the fact remains, a deal goes through him. You have to... There, there has to be some level of faith and trust or else you don't help the dreamers. You have to work your work way around that. And so I, I feel the fallacy in the Democrats' mind is Trump is a fundamentally untrustworthy. I, I have to beat him into submission. Here's where I think the problem here's where I think the big problem is. I don't think the I don't think the danger is Trump vetoing a bill. I think the danger is Trump moving um, members with his tweets. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So in other words, I think that if you could get the Senate and the House to just ignore Trump, pass something that they believe is a good deal that that protects dreamers, let's say, and then dare Trump to veto it. I think he probably signs it. But the problem yeah. is when he uses the, you know, his his megaphone, he's going to move Republican senators and congressmen and upset the apple cart and prevent them from passing legislation to begin with. Well, I think that was sort of McConnell's point where he was trying to signal to Trump, look, I'm Mitch McConnell, I have no soul, I'll pass anything, I don't really care. I want to get this monkey off my back. <laughs> I've actually but made I, that but argument I, but I don't want to stick my neck with out. my boss in the past. What's that? Just tell me what you want me to write. Right. Right. Wrong out but, loud. 
but I don't want to put my members on the line and then have you veto it because <laughs> that's going to screw all my guys. <laughs> so just tell, tell me one way or another what you're willing to do so I can then do my job. <laughs> I'm joking, of course, but hasn't almost every employee had that, you know, at some point in your career, that conversation with your okay. boss? Like, just tell me what you want. <laughs> what gotta, you want to do. I should go take care of my sick children. All right. <laughs> Great show. Uh, even even on, uh, uh, you know, a, a rough night's rest, <laughs> I think still better than all the others. So good work, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'll talk to you next week. All right. See you guys. Bye-bye.